thinking about determining age at death is the next key stage of an osteological analysis. So what we want to do in this case is to try and assign a chronological age to an individual. How old were they when they died? This is something we can't do with a great degree of precision. What we can do, however, is assign a biological age to that person. It corresponds to the rate of decay and development of the skeleton. It doesn't necessarily tell you exactly how many years it's been since they were born. If we're looking at juveniles, we can look at the gradual development, fusion, ossification, eruption of teeth, all those stages of growth and development that children go through. And because children grow and develop very quickly, we can determine age at death in young individuals with a great degree of accuracy. We'll combine a variety of methods. We'll look at what we call epiphyseal fusion, which is the growth, development and fusion of the ends of the bone. In young growing children, the diaphysis, the long bone shaft, and the epiphyses, the ends, are actually separate. This allows the three-dimensional growth of these structures. Once growth is largely complete, they'll then fuse back together. And so the rate at which this fusion occurs can be tied into the developmental stage of a child. And if we know in a modern population when these different stages occur, we can predict in an ancient population when those stages would have occurred as well. A really accurate way of determining age at death in young children is actually to look at dental development. The teeth seem to be one of the most highly genetically controlled parts of growth and development. So no matter how healthy you are as a child, your teeth will tend to develop and erupt at exactly the same rate. So we look both at the sequence of eruption of teeth into occlusion, so when they come up and start to be used for chewing, but also in x-rays we can see the gradual development of the early stages of the teeth as well. And the pattern of growth and development can tie into chronological age really quite accurately. Long bone length is another way. We can look at the overall size of the child, although of all the methods this is quite significantly affected by growth retardation. So if a child doesn't have a suitable diet, they won't grow as fast, and therefore their bones will appear to be a lot younger than the actual age of that particular child. So broadly, determining age at death in juveniles is a very accurate and precise process. In adults, it's a lot more challenging. Once the skeleton has formed and fully fused, there are no more defined stages of, of development. What we do find, however, is a gradual sequence of degeneration. So when you hit around about 30 and the last epiphysis is fused in your body, all there is in the future is decay, which is very nice for those of us who are around that age. <laughs> so essentially what happens is the joints start to degrade, they start to show signs of joint disease, and overall we're able to start detecting these changes in our morphological analyses. The key thing here is to focus on the immobile joints. That's because if you're a very active person during life, the mobile joints will decay much quicker than a very sedentary person. So you don't, for example, want to look at the hip joint because the age at death determined from the hip joint in a very active person will give a very old age, whereas the same joint of someone of the same age who has been less active will give a much younger age. So we look at the immobile joints of the pelvis, the pubic symphysis at the front, and the auricular surface at the back, where the pelvis joins on to the sacrum. And we also look at things such as the ends of the ribs, where they meet at the sternum in the midline. Broadly together, these methods can provide us with an age at death range, which is precise to around about the nearest 10 years. So if we compare that with the methods that we use for juveniles, they're much, much less precise. There are other potential methods. We looked briefly at the beginning at osteons, these units of bone structure. There are patterns of change that we see in the osteons which correlate to age at death as well. For archaeology, this is sometimes problematic because it requires you to cut cross sections into the bone and image those in microsco microscopy, for example. And we can't always justify the destructive analysis, these cutting up of human bones, if we could apply methods that are non-destructive. One final thing we can look at is tooth wear. Now, I mentioned that teeth come into occlusion at about the same time in all children. And then gradually over time, they will start to wear away. So the enamel on the surfaces of your teeth will wear away, revealing the dentine underneath. 
This accumulates gradually over time, so in theory is a really viable method of determining age at death. But one potential problem is the fact that it does also relate to the coarseness of your diet. So if you have a very coarse diet, your teeth will wear down a lot faster than someone who is eating a soft diet. This makes methods based on dental wear quite population specific. So it means you kind of need to know what people are eating before you can say what age they are from dental wear. The methods that we have out there are developed on specific populations. So they don't always match up with the populations that we happen to be studying at the time. So why determine age at death? Well, demographic data, this pattern of age at death within a population, reflects something called age-specific mortality. It reflects the risk of dying at various stages of the life course. This in itself can be incredibly interesting. It tells us about population structure, it tells us about patterns of fertility, it tells us about patterns of mortality in the past. We can also explore age-related diseases. So things that appear during old age or things that preferentially affect children, for example. Also in, associated with disease, in association with diseases, we can explore the issue of whether diseases preferentially affect a particular part of the population and whether they tend to cause mortality in a particular part of the population. If we look at the mortality curves, so graphs showing the number of individuals that died in different age categories, we can sometimes identify specific diseases just from the patterns of people which they kill. One in partic particular example where you can see a very distinct difference in the pattern between normal death and pathological death is during the Spanish flu outbreak, the influenza outbreak in the early 20th century. In this case, we find what is called a catastrophic mortality profile. This is a situation where a disease is killing people relatively indiscriminately, regardless of how old they are. This creates a very flat mortality profile where the same numbers of people are dying in every age category. This contrasts very distinctly with what we call an attritional mortality profile, which is a situation where people are dying of relatively normal natural causes. Probably still diseases, but not unusual epidemic diseases. In this case, we find a peak of death in very young children, as in any pre-industrial, pre-modern medicine population, infant mortality tends to be very high. Then mortality drops down through older childhood and then gradually increases again up to older adulthood. So this distinction between these profiles can be very informative. <laughs>